Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. An original radio play inspired by the life of Susan B. Anthony. Starring in the role of Susan B. Anthony, the distinguished American actress Cornelia Otis Skinner. The Cavalcade of America is presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry and is dedicated to those men and women in every walk of life who have shaped the destiny of America in the past and to the youth of today who will shape the destiny of America in the future. The other day, a man with curiosity decided to get some real information about a feminine habit. Like most men, he'd often watch women search through their handbags on a bus or a streetcar at a ticket window. He wondered how many items were actually carried by the average woman in her handbag. And so he had a count made. The final figure showed an average of 39 items per handbag. Uh, One woman carried 106 different articles. And the variety of things found in this search ranged from the usual lipstick and powder to an extra pair of stockings and even a dog collar. So it's easy to see why women's handbags must have capacity nowadays. But the reason why they're handsome and colorful and yet so inexpensive is another story, one in which chemistry plays a part. One of the earliest developments of our modern chemical age was peroxylin coated fabrics, which DuPont makes under the trademark Fabricoid. About 40 years ago, Fabricoid was used as an upholstery material for buggy seats and dashboards. Then DuPont chemists began to improve it, gave it color, various interesting textures, and even greater wearability, with the result that today, coated fabrics serve hundreds of uses. One of these is in the form of Tantine, the first of all washable window shades noted for its beauty and long life. Another use important to women is handbags. It wasn't so many years ago that women had to pay at least $5 for a good-looking handbag. Today, she can buy several smart handbags made of Fabricoid for the same amount, and thus can have a different bag to match each costume. And they stay attractive because they're washable. Now, this entrance of peroxylin-coated fabric into the handbag field has had other important effects. In 15 years, The number of people employed in making handbags of coated fabrics has jumped from less than 2,000 to a total of over 10,000 people. Chemistry, too, supplies frames and fittings of DuPont plastics, rayon for linings, work for more people in plants than still other manufacturers. Another manifestation of the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. Cornelius Otis Skinner as Susan B. Anthony in The Cavalcade of America. In a small town of the America of 1838, a girl just arrived home from an academy for young gentlewomen had returned to her father's household, presumably to fold her hands and wait for her husband. But that young gentlewoman was Susan B. Anthony. Susan, you've had your nose buried in that newspaper for an hour. I've been reading President Van Buren's message to Congress, Father. Didn't they teach you at that finishing school that young ladies are not supposed to stick their noses into politics? Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Stanton do. They're fighting for women's rights. And they're perfect ladies. Women's rights? What rights? Susan, you'd better begin doing some work for your hope chest. That's my advice to you. Father... If all I'm expected to do is gather some things for a hope chest, why did I need an education? Why, why, so you'll be a credit to your husband, of course. A woman of attainments and adornment for some man's household. So that's it. I've been groomed to adorn somebody's household like, like a prize mare in a stable. Susan. Oh, Father, I, I shocked you so terribly, haven't I? I do apologize. But I feel so, so useless. I was wondering, Father, couldn't I find some employment? Employment? You're a woman, Susan. Women don't work. As long as I'm head of this family, you'll obey me. But, Father, there are women working. There are women in your factory. I saw them. You have no place in the factory. Yes, I have, Father. If other women can work, so can I. Oh, please, Father, it's worth a try. Women have rights, and they'll be recognized someday. All right, All right, go ahead. You'll soon forget these noble ideas, young lady. We'll see if you like to work after a few days at the looms. 
then there'll be no more talk about women's rights from you. Hey, you. Were you speaking to me? Sure. What's your name? It's Susan. Susan um, O'Malley. Never worked before, have you? No, I haven't. But I'm happy to work. It's what I wanted. You won't get what you want here or any place. What is there in life for us women? Shh. Your hawk. Who's your hawk? Sure, I'm Stanton. Old Hawkeye. Who'd you think? You mean my... I mean our employer? Sure. He don't want us to talk when we're working. You better come to meeting tonight. Learn a few things. What kind of a meeting is it? It's for women's rights. But why all this secrecy? We got to keep our jobs. But you know what's wrong with having a meeting. It's against the law for women to hold meetings. But that's ridiculous. Sure it is. But don't forget, men make the laws. That's why we're having the meeting. We've got to organize for our rights so we'll have something to say about things. I think I see now. Jim, we don't own men here. We mean outside. In our homes. Our kids. School. Things like that. You gonna come? Yes. I'll be there, all right? Yes, I'd... I'd like to attend your meeting very much. Stanton, on behalf of our Working Girls Organization for Women's Rights, I want to thank you for coming here this evening and bringing us your inspiring message. Thank you, Madam Chairman and young women. Now, in closing, let us keep these resolutions firmly in our minds. We shall organize a movement to bring to the women of this country the full and equal rights as citizens they are now denied. Our primary step will be to secure for women the right to vote. Once this is accomplished, our nation will see the complete emancipation of women in every walk of life. Thank you, and good night. Well, girls, that's all for tonight. Meeting's adjourned. Mrs. Stanton? Mrs. Stanton? Yes. What is it? Mrs. Stanton, you probably don't remember me, but I heard you speak at our school. My name's Susan Anthony, and I... Oh, yes. I do remember you. You were the one who asked so many questions. But what are you doing here? I'm working in the factory. But you don't belong in a factory, Miss Anthony. Oh, yes, I do. Anywhere I can learn things. I want to do something for women's rights. You do? Do you very much? Yes, Mrs. Stanton. Miss Anthony, will you take my advice then? Yes, I will. Then give up your employment. Be a teacher. It's the one profession open to women. You can help our suffrage movement by teaching what it means to our youth. Will you do that? I'll do whatever I can, Mrs. Stanton. <laughs> The, uh, the New York State Teachers' Convention is now in session. The uh, first question scheduled for debate is the question, uh, what can we do to increase the public's respect for the teaching profession? The, the chair is ready to recognize delegates who wish to speak to the question. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Miss Anthony. I wish to speak to the question. <laughs> well, uh... Miss Anthony, our time being limited and uh, recognizing a delegate not versed in parliamentary procedure, that is... Mr. Uh, Chairman, I know enough about parliamentary procedure to know that you are violating every principle of it at this moment. I repeat, I wish to speak to the question. Well, uh, is there a second? I second the motion. Discussion. Mr. Chairman, I raise a point of order. No woman has ever entered into parliamentary discussion 
I hold that precedent rules Miss Anthony out of order. Is it the gentleman's contention that I am not a qualified delegate to this convention? Not a delegate qualified to enter into debate. There's nothing in the rules of this convention disqualifying any delegate from debate. Mr. Chairman, is Miss Anthony to be ruled solely by the rules of this convention and not by moral and natural laws? There's nothing in the rules specifically prohibiting murder on this floor. It might be to the gentleman's interest if there were. Oh. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, please. If there is no objection, the chair grants Miss Anthony the floor and limits her time for debate to one minute. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One minute is ample for what I have to say. You ask why the teaching profession is not as highly thought of as, say, the profession of medicine or of law. I'll tell you. Women who are not considered bright enough to be doctors or lawyers are nevertheless considered bright enough to teach the nation's youth. If you want to improve your station in life, all you fine gentlemen, I suggest you join the woman suffrage movement. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Stanton, I'm not a teacher anymore. I know. I read the papers. Oh, Susan, you shouldn't have mentioned suffrage. We must be greater in numbers before we'll have sufficient influence to amend the Constitution. Mrs. Stanton, it's high time someone did. I have a petition here for the legislature, and I'm going to have 10,000 names before it adjourns. But this is for woman suffrage, Susan. We can never get signatures for this. I think we can, high and low. And I'm going to get the support of the biggest editor in this country, Horace Greeley. <laughs> well, well, ladies, uh, what can I do for you? Mr. Greeley, years ago you were almost alone among editors in your support of women's rights. We wish to know why you are opposed today. Miss Anthony... I have always favored women's rights. I believe that economically, financially, and in the eyes of the court, woman should stand on an equal footing with man. But politically, no. But, Mr. Greeley, you must realize that without the ballot, woman has no power to improve her position in all the other respects. <laughs> Are you aware, Miss Anthony, that the ballot and the bullet go together? If you vote, are you also prepared to fight? Certainly, Mr. Greeley. Just as you fought in the late war, at the point of a goose quill. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Anthony, this is my final word. I stand on the fact that the best woman I know, my wife, does not want to vote. Uh, pardon me a moment, Mr. Greeley. Mrs. Curtis. Uh, yes, Miss Anthony. The petition, please. Mr. Greeley, I hold in my hand a petition signed by 300 women of Westchester County asking that the word male be stricken out of the Constitution. I am not interested in a list of names, Miss Anthony. Perhaps you will be, Mr. Greeley, when I tell you the first name on the list is Mrs. Horace Greeley. And I tell you there will be thousands more. <laughs> What? Help you undermine the sanctity of the home? No. Will you sign the petition? So you're Susan Anthony. Why, I heard you were the worst ever. But you're not at all. Yes, I'll sign it gladly, Miss Anthony. Will you sign the petition? Why don't you stay home where any decent woman belongs? I tell you, you won't get a single solitary name in this town. Will you sign the petition? Certainly not. The place for you is in jail. Will you sign the petition? Yes, I'll sign it. Will you sign the petition? Get out, you brazen hussy. Anthony. I didn't expect the pleasure of seeing you on this train. Oh, good morning, Senator. I don't see how you stand this constant traveling about. As a junior senator, I made many tiresome journeys to see my constituents. 
Thank heaven I don't have to do that anymore. Senator, are you really so secure you don't have to find out what the people want? Tut, tut. You women will never comprehend the elemental in politics, Miss Anthony. People don't know what they want. Perhaps you should go back to elemental, Senator, and meet your constituents as you used to. What do you mean by that? I mean I've been meeting your people. I've been traveling all over America. And I've found they do know what they want. They want women's suffrage. And they're going to get it. You're very determined, aren't you, Miss Anthony? I have a plan, Senator. I'm going to do two things that women aren't supposed to do at all. I'm going into a barber shop. What? And I'm going to vote. Next? Who's next? Oh, excuse me, lady. You don't want to come in here. This is a barber shop. Oh, but I do. Isn't this where you register? Well, yeah, but, well, well, right in the back room, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, pardon me, but is this where I registered to vote? Boys, here's a lady who wants to vote. <laughs> hey, you're Miss Anthony, aren't you? Yes, I'm Susan Anthony. This is my voting district. I'm afraid not, ma'am. Only men can vote. Is the Constitution a joke? Well, what do you mean, joke? Well, I have here copies of two amendments to the Constitution of the United States. Amendment 14 says that all persons born in the United States are citizens of the United States. Yes, I know all that, Miss Anthony, but you... And Amendment 15 says that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied. Yes, but you can't... Does it say anything about male or female in those amendments? No, it doesn't, but I... Are women persons? Now, you know that ain't the point at all, Miss Anthony. Oh, but it is. It's just the point. But I can't register you, miss. You can't flop the Constitution. Well, I don't know what I should do about this. I know what you can do. You can register us. Well, may mean my neck and yours too, Miss Anthony, but here goes. Your name, address, and occupation. The case of the people of the United States versus Susan B. Anthony. It is charged that the defendant on or about the 5th day of November, 1872, at the city of Rochester, New York, in an election held in the 8th Ward for a representative in the Congress of the United States did then and there vote without having a legal right. Gentlemen of the jury, you've heard the evidence presented in this case. I will not expatiate on the character of the defendant. Her behavior has been a nationwide scandal for many years. This case has nothing to do with any constitutional issue. It's a question of fraudulent voting. I ask you to find the defendant guilty of this crime. Your Honor. Mr. Selden. May it please the court. As counsel for Miss Anthony, I strongly object to this proceeding. This is a criminal charge. Your Honor has no right to direct the jury's verdict. The clerk of the court will take the jury's verdict. Your Honor, I demand that the jury be questioned individually. To get that opinion for the record. Denied. Clerk will record the verdict of guilty. Now, has the prisoner anything to say why sentence shall not be pronounced? Your Honor, I have many things to say. My natural rights as a human being, my political rights as a citizen of this country, even my judicial rights as a prisoner at the bar are all being violated. I repeat the question. Will the defendant explain to the court why sentence should not be pronounced? Certainly. You have denied me the fundamental privilege of citizenship. You have degraded me from the status of a citizen to that of a subject. <laughs> the court cannot allow further time. Your Honor, I'm simply stating why sentence cannot be pronounced against me. Your denial of my right to a trial by a jury of my equals is an offense against the law. The court cannot allow the prisoner to go on. May it please, Your Honor, not one of those jurymen is my equal, but native or foreign-born, white or black, rich or poor, educated or ignorant, sober or drunk. Each and every man of them was not my equal, but my political superior. Is that all, Miss Anthony? That's all? And I ask not leniency, but a course that will do you far more harm. 
the full rigor of your self-constituted so-called law. So be it. The sentence of the court is that you pay a fine of $100 in the cost of prosecution. I'll never pay one penny of that fine. What is the alternative, Judge Hunt? The court cannot permit the defendant to make a martyr of herself by resisting the court's sentence. Then I repeat, I shall resist this injustice to the end of my days and persuade all women that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Susan B. Anthony did resist. And fortunately for her cause, her days were long. They were long enough, even for a hostile press that had once reviled her, to cry out against that same injustice. And as the long days rolled into the long years, she became, even to her enemies, a brave and heroic figure. There came a day when her secretary entered with a morning mail. Good morning, Miss Anthony. Here's your newspaper. Thank you. And listen to this. As we approach a new century the 20th century, a valiant fighter of the old is approaching her 80th year, and the whole nation takes this occasion to honor the spirit of Susan B. Anthony. Well, Miss Anthony, that's a great change from what the papers used to say about you. Why not? They think I've failed, and at 80, they no longer fear me. Well, I'm thinking of retiring soon. That should bring even more bouquets from the press. Retiring, Miss Anthony? Yes. But before I retire, I've got one more job to do. What is that? I have a letter here from Lady Aberdeen, the leader of the women's suffrage movement in England. If I can help the suffrage movement in England, it will help us here. But you know the influence of Queen Victoria in England, and she's violently against women's suffrage. That if Queen Victoria were to receive me at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> oh, Miss Anthony, you are the greatest politician of modern times. <laughs> Thank you. That does me more good than a dozen flowery editorials. Her Majesty the Queen will be pleased to receive an audience at Buckingham Palace. Her loyal subjects, the Lady Aberdeen, and the most especially desires that Lady Aberdeen's guest, Miss Susan B. Anthony, will be able to accompany her. Now, don't be nervous, my dear. You will find the Queen quite as easy to talk with as anyone, should I curtsy. For Americans, it's optional. And I should say, there's the Chamberlain now. Her Majesty the Queen. Oh, it seems so very, very old. Not much older than you and I. It's as if she were carrying an enormous burden. And she is. She's beckoning to us now. Lady Aberdeen and Miss Anthony. Lady Aberdeen? Your Majesty. And Miss Anthony. Oh, how do you do? Thank you. We are pleased to welcome you, Miss Anthony. Your Majesty is most gracious. We have been interested to observe your work for the political emancipation of women, Miss Anthony. It is an heroic work. But we must confess, we do not in any sense embrace your view. But your majesty rules a great empire. Out of duty, not out of choice, Miss Anthony. Yes. When the prince consort was alive, we acceded to his every wish. We have never had cause to regret it. All women have not been so fortunate, Your Majesty. Age has probably made us both more tolerant, Miss Anthony. Yes. But even should yours be the right view, 
I do not believe that in our lifetime we shall ever see the political freedom of women. And if we don't, <laughs> Your Majesty, no one can live forever. And someone has said that a man is immortal as long as one idea lingers behind him when he's gone. And I can only hope that the idea I have fought for will be of everlasting good when I have gone. <laughs> Susan B. Anthony did not live to see women go to the polls as full-fledged voters. But the right to vote was the priceless heritage she has left to the women of America. For her lifelong crusade in the name of complete freedom, Susan B. Anthony takes an honored place in the cavalcade of America. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of this week's DuPont Cavalcade, Cornelia Otis Skinner. Thank you. You have just heard the story of a woman who lived a life of sacrifice. She wanted to make the world a better place for human beings. Nothing was too great. No fight was too hard. The free spirit of Susan B. Anthony could not be conquered. It seems to me she has left us that spirit. And if she were among us, we would see her, we'd see Susan B. Anthony out front, as she was in her own time, and we would hear her, hear that moving cry of hers against whatever injustice is striking at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Susan B. Anthony was that kind of woman. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Skinner. And now a word about next week's program from the DuPont Cavalcade of America's historian, Dr. Frank Monahan of Yale University. Many years ago, the American philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson, said that when nature has work to be done, she creates the genius to do it. And so there came in time one man who devoted his life to the preservation of the human race against a deadly enemy, yellow fever. This man was Walter Reed, whose story we will bring you next week. In these times, it is well for us to recall the significance of a triumph of the human spirit and to accord that spirit our fervent tribute. In the DuPont exhibit at the World's Fair of 1940, you can see for yourself striking demonstrations of the numerous things which DuPont chemistry has developed or improved for your convenience and happiness. This is a cordial invitation to you as a cavalcade listener to visit the DuPont Wonder World of Chemistry exhibit. There, an alert staff of people will be happy to welcome you and answer any of your questions. In our story of Walter Reed, the DuPont cavalcade next week will present the distinguished radio actor, John McIntyre. The orchestra and the original musical effects on the Cavalcade of America are under the direction of Don Bury. This is Basil Rysdale sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.